Welcome everybody to Rush University Medical Center Division of Nephrology Renal Biopsy Conference for October 21st, 2021. Today's CME activity code is 483779. This is being recorded and will be on our YouTube channel shortly. Uh, if you're not on our mailing list, let us know. We'd be glad to add you to the weekly mailing list and please join our YouTube channel and spread the word. Um, as usual, we have nothing to disclose and the patient has been de-identified. Uh, today we have uh, four guests, uh, that, uh, residents that are interviewing today for fellowship. Welcome everybody, we're glad to have you join us. Uh, we've got a great case today, it's a little different, uh, it's a little different approach, it'll be a lot of fun. I'm really curious to see what everyone thinks and what everyone's opinion will be on the diagnosis and the treatment. We have three polls that we're going to go through. Uh, as we go as we go through this, um, as long as you're not a co-host, you can uh, you can vote on the po on the poll. Um, and the chat room, the chat box is open, so anybody that's not considered a co-host can uh, put their questions in the box, and we'll try to address them as we see them as we're going through the case. Uh, Doctor uh, Sadiki is going to read the case today, uh, so I think we'll move along. And uh, Faraz, once you get ready, you can uh, start. Uh, Protocol, please. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm ready. Take it away. Uh, the patient is a 45 year old African American male with past medical history of chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy. He's trach and PAG dependent because of this. Uh, chronic sacral decubitus ulcer, chronic TMJ sat uh, status post uh, elective open reduction and hypothyroidism. He presented to the hospital with anasarca and shortness of breath. On admission, his serum BUN and creatinine were 25 and 0.32 respectively. His serum albumin was uh, 0.5 grams. Um, serological workup uh, at that time had a positive ANA uh, greater than one, uh, 1 to 320 uh, with a speckled pattern. Um, but normal anti-double stranded DNA, ANCA, P MPO, and PR3 were negative. Uh, his SSA was elevated at greater than eight, uh, with a normal being less than one, and a negative SSB. Uh, normal SCL70 as well. Uh, C3 was low at 67. C4 was also low at 16. His ESR was high at 87, and CRP was high at nine. Um, his urinalysis demonstrated no blood or RBCs, uh, three plus protein, uh, negative Luke esterase with five to 10 WBCs and occasional granular casts. Uh, serum and urine uh, immunoelectrophoresis were negative for monoclonal protein, but did have polyclonal staining for IgA, IgG, uh, kappa and lambda. Uh, further workup revealed a left upper extremity DVT and he was started on therapeutic Lovenox. A VQ scan was indeterminate for CT, uh, was indeterminate, and thus he had a CTPE, and that was negative for PE. Uh, he was started on Bumex two milligrams BID for diuresis. Uh, he denied any NSAID intake. Uh, so his past medical history: he has a history of CIDP, uh, a chronic sacral decubitus ulcer, chronic TMJ, and hypothyroidism. Uh, his surgical history includes the open reduction of his DMJ. Uh, a peg placement and a take tracheostomy. Uh, he's a never smoker, doesn't drink or use any illicit substances. He has no family history of kidney or autoimmune disease and first degree relatives. On review of systems, his complaints are weakness, uh, which, which is chronic, uh, along with shortness of breath and uh, swelling. Uh, he has no rashes or arthralgias. He has no known drug allergies. Uh, he takes uh, prednisone 10 milligrams once a day, uh, Norco 5325 uh, as needed, uh, Ativan half a milligram once a day, Levothyroxine 100 mics, uh, and uh, Omeprazole 20 milligrams once a day. On uh, physical exam, he's afebrile. Uh, blood pressure is a little on the lower side at 91 over 60. Uh, his heart rate is 103, respirate is uh, 20. Uh, his height is 185 centimeters uh, and weight is 63 kilograms. He has a BMI of 18. Uh, he's saturating 99% on two liters. Uh, he's very thin, cachectic, uh, has muscle wasting, but is in no distress, resting comfortably. Um, 
on ENT exam, he has no lymphadenopathy. He has a trach collar uh, in place without any signs of infection. Uh, and lungs uh, demonstrate diffuse crackles, uh, but he's not in any respiratory distress. There's no accessory muscle use. Uh, on cardiac exam, he's tachycardic with a normal rhythm, no rub or murmurs. Uh, abdominal exam, he's got normal bowel sounds. He's got the PEG in place. The site looks good. There's no signs of infection of the site. Uh, on musculoskeletal exam, he's got three plus pitting edema of all of his extremities. Uh, he has no joint synovitis. Uh, on neurological exam, he's got diffuse upper and lower extremity weakness. And on skin, again, he has no rashes. Labs on admission show a uh, serum sodium of 136, potassium 4.2, chloride of 102, bicarb of 26, a BUN of 25, and creatinine of 0 0.32. Uh, glucose was 76. Uh, total protein was 4.4. Albumin was 0 0.5. Calcium was 8.6. Uh, total bile was uh, undetectable. Uh, Alkphos was 213. ASD and ALT were 33 and 27. His total cholesterol on lipid panel was 139, triglycerides were 171, HDL was 25, and LDL was 150. On uh, CBC, his, he had a white count of 27.9 with an absolute neutrophil count of 23.2. Hemoglobin was 11.1 with an MCV of 94 and a platelet count of 613. Uh, C3 was 67, C4 was 16, ESR was 87, CRP was 9, ANA was positive uh, at uh, 1 to 320, speckled pattern, P anca, C anca, MPO, and PR3 were negative. SSA was positive at greater than 8, SSB was negative, double stranded DNA was uh, normal, anti PLA2R antibody was negative. Uh, he, uh, he had uh, no COVID, uh, Hep B and Hep C serologies were also negative. Uh, on UA, uh, it was, his urine was yellow, turbid, with sp specific gravity of uh, 1.024, a pH of 6, uh, no glucose, 600 protein, uh, no blood, uh, 0 to 5 RBCs, uh, 5 to 10 WBCs, negative leukase rays, no squamous epi, uh, epithelial cells, uh, and occasional granular casts. His uh, urine protein to creatinine ratio was 6.6 grams per uh, 6 grams per gram. Uh, he, his ultrasound showed uh, two kidneys that were normal in size and echogenicity. The right kidney measured 10.1 centimeters. The left one measured 10.5 centimeters, and there was no hydronephrosis. So he underwent a percutaneous renal biopsy. Thank you, Faraz. Uh, any questions uh, for Dr. Siddiqui? Yeah. Do we have any any past laboratory information as far as what this gentleman's proteinuria was, or did I miss it? No, he we had. Did not. For us, uh, he had uh, care everywhere. Uh, he had a protein uh, creatinine ratio of like five about a year ago, five grams. Per so it's been elevated for a while then. Yes. Okay. Uh, a question in the chat is how bad is his decubitus ulcer? Uh, uh, you know, there's grades and there's, uh, I don't remember how to grade them. It wasn't the worst I've ever seen, but certainly, uh, you know, he's living on his back. So um, not minor either. Uh, Dr. Whittier, you want to give us a differential diagnosis? Uh, sure. Thanks. Um, we've got a guy with, uh, with, Chronic inflammatory demyelinating polyneuropathy, and he's he's uh, also got a decubitus ulcer because he's bed bound. Um, I'm just trying to associate chronic inflammatory polyneuropathy with any GNs, and I, nothing really was coming to mind. I, I think if if someone's got a demyelinating neuropathy, it could be autoimmune in nature. We typically think of a vasculitis as more of a mononeuritis multiplex, not this poly. Uh, although there may be an association, possibly something with lupus could be associated with that as well. Um, but I, I was kind of stretching my uh, memory on trying to figure out an association more than that. But, but then we uh, get a little bit further history and we see that he does have this uh, sacral decubitus ulcer and he's had a history of five grams from over a year ago and he's still very, very nephrotic. Um, despite being that nephrotic for that long, he still has a normal renal function 
uh, with a creatinine of 0.3 for his, for his size, which is very, very tiny considering he still has three plus edema and he still only weighs 63 kilograms. Um, so I was even further, we've got a positive ANA, we've got hypocomplementemia. So really the differential here is pretty broad. Um, when I link the decubitus ulcer to kidney disease, we often think about secondary amyloid. Uh, what else would be consistent with that would be that his kidneys are 10 centimeters, which I imagine is relatively large for him, but maybe not. Hard to really say there. Uh, the other issue is that his cholesterol is not nearly as abnormal as one would expect for someone who had nephrotic syndrome, not on a statin uh, for that long. And so that also, in my recollection, goes a little bit more with amyloid. Uh, and so I would think about a secondary amyloid in this case. Uh, could he have primary amyloid? I guess so, but nothing. And obviously, we need to think about any kind of immunoglobulin <laughs> problem when we have hypocomplementemia based on my learning from last week. Uh, at a biopsy conference, which wasn't on my differential before that. So if it's not secondary amyloid, could it be uh, lupus? Absolutely. Uh, we've got CIDP, we've got hypothyroidism, we have low complements, we have a positive ANA. Uh, that certainly all points towards lupus. Could it be lupus that hasn't caused renal failure for over a year? Possibly. Would I uh, guess the lesion if it was lupus as a lupus membranous would probably be my most likely because those are most often the ones that are serologically quiescent, although he does have hypocomplementemia. Um, but I would include lupus uh, membranous in the differential. The other part that goes along with membranous, and this may be lupus membranous or, or PLA to R negative uh, membranous as well, is that he also has had a DVT. Obviously, any nephrotic syndrome patient and someone who's bed bound would be at risk for DVTs, but membranous uh, is associated with uh, thromboembolism more so than other other uh, GNs. So I would kind of think that of it being my top two would be a lupus membranous and an amyloid. Could he have focal sclerosis? Of course. Could he have minimal change? I would think very unlikely considering it's been going on for so long and he also doesn't have hyperlipidemia. Could he have, uh, what else is there, membranous, primary, as well as PLA2R is negative. So I guess it doesn't exclude it, but in my mind, it's pretty much excluded by that. So I, I think my top number one would be uh, secondary amyloid. Number two, I would say lupus membranous. Great. In the chat, uh, several things have come up. Uh, uh, the the uh, apparently an association of membranous to uh, CIDP, an association of focal sclerosis to CIDP, and even minimal change. But those patients might have been receiving alpha interferon. But certainly a lot of uh, um, GN associations that uh, I was unaware of uh, when I uh, saw this patient. Um, Me too, when but... I just discussed it. <laughs> <laughs> but I think about an inflammatory uh, neuropathy, it would, you know, possibly even some chronic inflammation from that leading to amyloid or, mm -hmm. or membranous is kind of what I think about when I have a chronic inflammatory state. So um, opening it up to our... Uh, our, our co-hosts, anybody have any other, any other ideas or strong feelings about uh, this before I open up a poll? No, I mean, I, I think what Bill says is what I would think in terms of inflammation, inflammation. I didn't know those associations either. So that's kind of interesting. But yeah, I mean, secondary amyloidosis um, versus I guess the membranous uh, would be kind of my top two uh, rather than minimal change just based on some of the, you know, the, the, the lipid panel and um, mainly there. All right. Uh, well, let's, uh, let's get our poll and see what the audience thinks here. All right. So the first poll question is, what is your prediction of the pathology? Um, idiopathic podocytopathy being minimal change or primary focal sclerosis, AA amyloid, uh, lupus-like podocytopathy uh, suggested by some of the autoimmune serology or something else as suggested by uh, the chat board. Those compliments are, you know, quite low too. And so looked at the, now I guess reflexively and look at the aspect. Well, C3 have. is a little low. C4 is kind of un, unimpressive, but yeah. But yeah, I mean, we, we didn't even go down that rabbit hole. So the, the fact that he's a 46 year old African American male, uh, I, I guess, you know, makes me think of April 1. Um, a consideration 
as a calcium lupus polyphytopathy, which you know it's just like minimal change clinically, but um, so with what a like a collapsing FSGS or or just in general? I mean, I think it could be collapsing, but it could also just be a massive full process effacement and. Interesting, it wouldn't explain the low C3, but I guess it could have some concomitant uh, class three uh, in the background. But if you had collapsing FSGS and it had proteinuria five grams a year ago, unless this guy is so cachectic, a creatinine of 0.3 would be kind of unusual, I would think. Yeah, my reaction was more of just minimal change type of, like just without uh, collapsing lesions. And without giving anything away, I mean, the, the polling's almost done, but without giving anything away, I look at this degree of nephrosis and I, you know, I, it screams a protocytopathy of some type to me. On the other hand, that's a long time to have that for a year. Um, uh, but you never know, you know, um, you just never know. Uh, Dr. Glassick says, I will go out on a limb and say this is membranous due to PLI2 are negative. Uh, due to contractin one and demyelinating polyneuropathy, so we'll see how uh, we'll see if he, that comes back to haunt him or to uh, or to congratulate him uh, as we go along the case. So um, share the either, results. We, yeah, yeah we'll share the results. Mm -hmm. um, has it come out? Yep, yep. People can see it. Uh, okay, so uh, only ten percent bought uh, idiopathic protocytopathy. The highest vote is for AA amyloid. Uh, from chronic inflammation, either related to polyneuropathy or his uh, chronic decubitus ulcer. We have 21% with lupus protocytopathy and about the same thing with something else. So the number one is AA amyloid. I like that diagnosis. Uh, we see a lot of these, a lot of patients at Rush that are, are bed bound, have chronic ulcers. Typically it's a gunshot wound uh, <clears throat> with uh, chronic ulcers and chronic decubes that have AA amyloid and are very, very nephrotic. Um, you know, you would wonder along the lines, if this has been going on a year, would you be that nephrotic and still have normal renal function? But you could say that about anything for that matter, except maybe minimal change. And, and again, the minimal change protocytopathy is kind of odd uh, because, uh, you know, as Bill pointed out, that cholesterol is pretty remarkably low. And, you know, as we've talked about many times in this conference, nothing's 100%, and that's why we do biopsies. So I think uh, let's go to the wheel and uh, see who is uh, gonna read this biopsy. Are you on? Yeah, Sim is on. Give me a second here, Austin. Awesome. Awesome's a second year fellow at Rush. You candidates can see what kind of training we give our fellows. Better not blow it, Awesome. <laughs> no pressure. No pressure. No pressure at all. Awesome, you can go ahead and unmute yourself now. Uh, I'm unmuted. Okay, perfect. I'm going to let you uh, I'm gonna share share the screen and I'll give you control here. Give me a second. Remember, there's a lag um, sometimes with the, the, the click. Give me a second here. All right. Go ahead and click on the screen. Yep. Uh, go click. Yep. Now you're controlling the screen. I'll let you advance the slides. Okay. You know the next one. Animation, animation. All right, so we're starting with, um, we have two cores here, basically low power um, trichrome stain. We're looking for any kind of uh, chronicity here with a bluish material. I, and I don't really see a lot of bluish material, um, if any. Uh, again, it's a low power. Um, I'm looking at the gloms. I have at least three gloms here in the lower core and then at least five to six in the upper core. And it's hard to comment on the gloms at this magnification, but at least I don't see a lot of chronicity and the tubules seem pretty much back to back. Okay, I agree. Then I have a um, high power um, HNE stain. Um, looking at the glom, there's a glom in the middle. Um, there are no obvious crescents here. 
Um, the glomerular capillaries uh, look pretty much patent to me. Um, I think there might be some component of um, some thickening of the GBMs here uh, that is pretty much diffuse um, and some component of mesangial expansion as well. But uh, there are no obvious crescents. The Bowman's space seems pretty open. Um, um, so I would say the main, main feature here is probably just the GBM thickening uh, and some mesangial um, expansion. Okay. And then uh, what structure is that at six o'clock just below the glomerulus? Uh, you mean here or this one? Yeah, right there. This is the, I think this is the artery. Yep, arterial. Yeah, this is the arterial. Yep. Arterial, yep, and and no, no thickening or hyalinosis. Looks widely patent. Yeah. All right, so we have the PA sustain now. Um, again, I'm looking for uh, the GBM looks pretty much, uh, I think in a lot of areas, it looks pretty thick to me. Um, there is some mesangial expansion here as well, but again, the glomerular capillary um, tough looks pretty much patent. Uh, I know one of the differential was um, amyloid doses, and you would see a weekly uh, positive PA sustain in that case, but here I think it's pretty bright. So um, it's pretty much similar to the last slide that we saw. Um, no crescents, glomerular capillary wall seems patent, and then again, some thickening of the GBM per se. Okay, good. This, this may be a little overreach uh, for me. That's why I'm not going to ask Awesome about it, but they do look a little round, a little proud, as Dr. George Janay used to say, which a little bit more like a lead pipe, which may point towards uh, membranous. I don't know if you agree with that, uh, David, or do you think that they're just normal? Yeah, yeah well, well, he's saying they are a little thickened. So yeah, I agree with both of you. Yeah, yeah, what, yeah. Do we know they, what's they thick? Proud. Do we know what's thick? He keeps saying GBM. Are we talking really about the capillary wall? That's what I was referring to. The... Uh, the glomerular based membrane in the capillary wall specifically, yes. Yeah, it's uh, it's all one unit that we're looking at here. But, you know, I don't know if you can point exactly out what Bill and everyone's referring to, but with your pointer, but if you look right or a little bit below the middle, you can see some yeah. loops that are even further down a little bit. They're yeah, those, almost just those, a little too perfect. They're a little too Yeah, round. they're just a little too perfect, a little too thick, a little too round, kind of lead pipe-ish, you know. Hmm. Um, and it's much easier to see here than on the uh, H&E. Mm -hmm. Right, so we have a Silvers or Jones stain. Um, basically, um, we are looking for any spikes, holes, um, breaks. Um, here, um, again, the, the capillary walls seem pretty patent. Um, if I look at the, again, the, the capillary walls, again, they are pretty thick to mm, me. Go to two o'clock. Two o'clock here. Oh yeah, here. Are these spikes that I'm looking at? There you go, yep. Okay. So there are definite spikes here in this area. Yeah. Um, and then the loop just below that as well. Yeah. Yeah, and then around four o'clock, yeah, yeah. Okay, mm -hmm. yep here in this area too. Yeah, so, so what does that make you think spikes. of? So that that's make that makes a uh, membranous nephropathy the main differential. Yep. And every once in a while you can see very large spikes in amyloid, but uh, they, they'd be uh, very, very large. Hmm. Cox comb. David, is that described, that Cox comb described to both primary and secondary amyloid? Yes. Okay. So an immunofluorescence um, stains positive for IgG, and it's more kind of a granular pattern, and again, along the, along the glomerular capillary walls and the GBMs, per se. Um, here, it says Congo red negative, so that, that takes out the amyloidosis out of the differentials here. Yeah. And what is this fluorescence diagnostic of, if you had this on an exam? This is, I mean, given the fact that there are spikes there and then uh, staining with IgG, that, that kind of goes along with the membranous nephropathy. Yep. And of note, there's really, I mean, uh, there's not much mesangial staining. Uh, it's mostly mm -hmm. in the capillary loops. That's sometimes helpful for primary and secondary. And sorry, just to remind, I think, because I read the protocol, or I was looking at it, the PLA2R in the serum was negative. Is that right? 
That is, that is right. Okay. Okay. All right. So we have the um, EM here. Um, just to orient ourselves, I think this is kind of going along the GVM. Uh, here we have the slide. I think this is the uh, the urinary space. Um, here we are looking at there are a lot of uh, GBM deposits, um, more so in the in the subepithelial region. Uh, I'm just kind of tracing them along here. And uh, again, as Dr. Rodby said, I don't really see a lot of um, you know mesangial deposits even in this slide as well. Um, other than that, I don't see. I don't know if we can see on this power, but I don't see any tubular reticular inclusions as well. Maybe they could be better appreciated on a higher magnification. Yeah, and then how about the foot processes? Yeah, the foot processes here, they do see me face to me. I think there is effacement of the foot processes as well. Yep, diffuse awesome. effacement. Okay. Awesome. If you were kind of looking at these deposits, I mean, how new would you try to make these out to be? There are, you know, there's a classification and in, in, depending on where they sit on the top, in the middle, being reabsorbed, et cetera. Yeah, um, I think... I think that since they are more towards the epithelial aspect, looks like this process has been going on for quite some time. Well, and, I guess, uh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. No, I mean, there's certainly massive deposits. I'm just looking at somebody who, you know, if he did have proteinuria a year ago, mm -hmm. and they're certainly not fresh deposits, but, you know, we don't see any intramembranous deposits, and we don't really, well, maybe a couple, but they're still kind of sitting on kind of high. And no reabsorbed deposits. So, you know, it implies it's, I don't know, not too old, not too new. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. You're getting some GBM reaction, but so you can see the spikes in the mm -hmm. middle of the screen. But but you're right, they're not intramembranous yet. So kind of subacute deposits, I guess. Yeah, I guess you'd think by now that some would be intramembranous, but yeah. if this was truly going on a year. But it's a moot point. It is the, the, the history is what the history and the pathology is, what the pathology is. Then again, another uh, EM, again, we are looking at a lot of um, kind of more subepithelial epithelial deposits and I'm just kind of tracing them all along here. Again, there is diffuse foot process effacement um, coupling with that. Um, so yeah, it's pretty much the same thing. So awesome, but before we advance, don't advance, what, what is, what's your diagnosis? So here, I think we, we have a membranous nephropathy, but as you said that the PLA2R was negative, I'm not sure if we have a setting for PLA2R in this, uh, in this biopsy, because at times we can see a negative PLA2R in the serum, but it can still be positive on the biopsy. So well, you're, based on this, whatever we have, this kind of goes along with the membranous nephropathy so far. Well, you're a good your straight other, man. Yeah, and your other points that you've already made of really important uh, negative uh, uh, like you said, that there were no tubular reticular inclusions, that it wasn't a full house, there wasn't a mesangial hypocellularity. All those are very, very important to point out as you did. So thank you. So uh, now you can advance it with a big drum roll. Wow. So I think we have an answer here now. Um, this is kind of almost diagnostic for uh, prim primary membrane nephropathy now. So... That gives us the clue. And it's the same, basically the same pattern as before. Very granular, very capillary mm -hmm. loop, really nothing in the mesangium. Yeah. So now I think we can say it's the primary membranous nephropathy. Say, or you could actually be more specific. You'd say anti-PLA2R. Anti-PLA2R, positive. I think that's kind of what we're preferring to, uh, to describe it now. Mm -hmm. um, so your final diagnosis is, I think you just gave it. <laughs> yeah, I think um, it's primary membranous. Yeah. So um, there's your diagnosis. And now I want to see uh, poll number two, what people would treat this patient with. So Roger, while we're waiting for that, since you saw this patient, I mean, sometimes the option really goes with how the patient looks. Uh, and we weren't able to really see that, but from his description in the protocol, he seemed very debilitated and, and pretty sick. Uh, is that, was that your assessment too, or did you, well, he was, he was younger, he could have been a little bit more healthy. Well, he was, you know, I mean, he clearly had very bad disease. He's got a trach and a peg and, you know, he's wasted in his, in his weight of 
63 kilograms is probably 25 kilograms of of edema right now too so it's kind of a little misleading his weight now um sick is one thing is i don't know how sick he looked but he but he did not obviously did not look good don't only really share uh give a second here last couple of votes coming in and then uh, i'll go ahead and share all right so everyone should be able to see the results so I'll, yeah so the results are um steroids uh three percent one person two people thought of cni um the highest was rituximab based regimen which was two-thirds of the patient 66 percent um 13 percent said cyclophosphamate based regimen and 13 percent said option three or or four which either rituxan or cyclophosphamide with option two which i thought was is a is an interesting um approach that a lot of people might take because he's so nephrotic so um you could advance this, advance the slides. So uh, now I'm going to really open it up to whomever really wants to uh, of this of this elite group here who wants to talk about what they would do and why they would do it, and we'll kind of throw it around the room here. We've got Dr. Baxi, Dr. Whittier, Dr. Corbett, Dr. Gashke, Dr. Glassick, of course, who's always serious. I couldn't find any picture of him, but his uh, completely serious professional self, and uh, and Dr. Rubin. So who wants to take over? Just speak up. Well, since you said elite, I'll keep quiet. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Dr. Glassick, well, t tell us what you would do. Well, Roger, I, I ask a question to the group. Is anybody concerned about the fact that the anti-PLA2R antibody is negative in this case with respect to the choice of treatment. Why is the anti-PLA2R antibody negative with such strong PLA2R antigen expression uh, and what looks like very active uh, electron dense deposit formation? Uh, I'd like to hear the uh, the other faculty uh, give me a rationale here for treating this patient with rituximab in the absence of circulating antibody. Yeah, I guess the, the you know the thought is because this has been obviously described on, on a number of occasions is that, and I think Dave Schlieben, one of our previous fellows, threw this up that it's uh, the kidneys acting kind of like a sink, you know, where it's all being kind of however. We, However sensitive the test is, which, you know, in measuring the circulating antibody, we'll assume it's fairly sensitive. The majority of it seems to be depositing in the kidney. Um, I still think, you know, as active as these lesions look, are active is probably not the right term, but, you know, as, as intensely as the immunofluorescence is, you got to believe that this isn't a burnt out process, I would think. So I, I think that uh, there's still antibody being produced. We're just not able to measure it. Maybe it's just being produced at such a low level, but it's clearly depositing and creating a problem. I, I think the issue is, is that, you know, and I guess I'm kind of throwing this out as a question as much as anything else. You know, all of the stuff that Wetzel and all these other people have done looking at the antibody level, levels associated with prognosis, and I don't know if this is what you're getting at, Dick, these kinds of people with the low, low titers of antibody or low levels usually have the best prognosis of even things of like spontaneous remission. But clearly in this guy's case, uh, of course, we don't know what his antibody level was before. That hasn't happened. Uh, whether it predicts that he'll be more responsive to any of the therapies, I guess, is another, another question. But uh, I, I think that even though we don't measure it uh, in his serum, we have to take this fairly seriously. I mean, he's already had a DVT. He's been nephrotic for a year at least. Um, this isn't going away, it doesn't appear. Well, uh, I'm not questioning the fact that he's severely nephrotic. What I'm questioning is, what is the immunological activity of his disease? 70% of patients with primary a uh, PLA2R antigen associated membranous will have a spontaneous remission if their antibody level is less than uh, 14 relative units per ml. Now, all we know is that this patient has a 
negative test. We don't know what the actual level is because that's not given. Is it above two and below 14 or is it less than two? It was less than two. Well, that, that means it's truly absolutely no detectable anti-PLA 2R antibody in circulation. And Bill's, I, I mean, Steve's explanation that this may be due to the sink hypothesis is certainly plausible, but it's also possible that the PLA2R antigen identification is a false positive. To that degree in the, in the biopsy? Well, there have been instances where very severe podocyte activation from immune deposit uh, formation has caused the podocyte to express uh, PLA2R antigen to an excessive extent. Uh, in other words, this is a phenomenon of podocyte activation. I'm just raising this because uh, the hooker in this patient is that he has a polyneuropathy, an inflammatory polyneuropathy, and this has been associated with membranous nephropathy. And in fact, a very extensive uh, report has just appeared in the literature associating uh, the two entities, membranous nephropathy and a polyneuropathy uh, via the deposition of contactin. And but isn't that, isn't I would that very much, I would very is... much like to see uh, this biopsy stained with contactin uh, to see whether or not this PLA2R antigen positivity is a false positive or a true positive. Obviously, if it's a true positive, then the sink hypothesis is probably the best explanation for the negative PLA2R antibody in the circulation. But, but what we're seeing on the fluorescence, I thought, was the antibody. And it was no, no, the that's the antigen. No, the, 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 this is not antibody you're staining for. This is antigen. Uh, I, I, then I, I've been wrong. I assumed that this was, uh, you know, uh, that we're basically got an antibody against the PLA two R antibody that's already on the, you know, in the in no the, the PLA two R antigen staining uses a a uh, polyclonal antibody to the PLA two R antigen in an indirect immunofluorescence method. It's not measuring uh -huh. antibody deposition. It's measuring antigen expression. Oh, I, 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 then I stand, I, I assume this was like, this was an anti-human, you know, IgG antibody directed at PLA2R antibody. I didn't realize it was the antigen itself. That no, no, it. no, the test that is done on frozen tissue is to detect the presence of an abnormal expression of PLA2R antigen expression. Uh, well, that's in this case, within the immune deposits, which are formed locally. So, well, I mean, the, I don't have any good answers here, but it's either the sink hypothesis that all of the antibody that this patient is forming is being sopped up by a massive expression of PLA2R antigen by podocytes, or alternatively, that the uh, PLHR antigen test is a false positive. So you're. So I want to know also. Uh, also, it would be very helpful to know what the IgG subclass is. We do not have IgG patient. subclass. Yeah, we don't have that. Uh, and um, you know, I think your point's well taken. That this is a little, as Steve says, a little different than how we think about how a lot of these uh, immuno lot uh, immunofluorescent stains. It's really just showing the expression of the PLA2R antigen, and uh, that um, uh, you know it, it possibly from something else, podocyte damage related to something else might do it. Uh, I was really unaware of any false positive staining like that to this degree. But you know, obviously, there's something very odd about this case, case which is just, which is what your whole point. And I don't think we have an explanation for it. Um, you know, looking for the staining for um, what was it? Um, Contactin. Yeah, contactin. I mean, I don't know if we'll be able to do that. It'd be something that we'll have to look into because I think that's a really interesting point. 
I don't know how available that is. And certainly we don't have it. I don't know if Mayo is or if Arcan is able to do that uh, staining and because uh, that might answer the question. Well, you um, can have it done because all it, it's done by laser dissection uh, mass spectrometry. And there are about three or four labs in the country that do it, including Arcana and Mayo Clinic. And all it requires is a, a set of unstained uh, sections uh, on slides and uh, mm -hmm. the glomeruli can be micro dissected and then studied by mass spectrometry. And if this case is really uh, truly a, a PLA2R associated membranous then, and not a contactin, then there ought to be only PLA2R antigen and not any contact. So I'm going to put you on the spot. I mean, you make a lot of good points, but what are you going to do for this patient, Dick? What are you going to get? What are you going to do? You're going to treat them. You're going, and you're not. You don't get any more information. No yeah. contactin, no yeah. IgG subclass. You just have to. You have to. You have to treat him. What would you give him? I'd probably bite the bullet and give him rituximab. Okay. But I don't know. I frankly, I I I am very suspicious that that might be efficacious because it is affecting and contact an antibody rather than affecting NPLA2R antibody. How interesting. Uh, I, I would all check all in with neurology also to, to see if see what the best treatment, because I know that for CIDP, we use plasmapheresis, they use IVIG. I don't know what the data is for CIDP is with rituxin or cytoxin. And that might also, you know, if you can kill two diseases with one medication, that might be an important part of this person's therapy yeah. as well. Let's, uh, let's go to the next slide, gotta move on. So how was he treated? Well, he did receive two grams of rituximab. He was anticoagulated and he was put on a statin, no surprise. Now here's the, the little bit of surprise that this actually occurred nine months ago and there was no nephrology follow-up. So he now presented to Rush nine months later with really bad anasarca. Um, and so he got two grams of rituxan, no follow-up. It's nine months later. His urine protein creatinine ratio is now 31 grams per gram. His serum creatinine is still 0 0.3. His serum albumin is 0 0.5. His cholesterol is a little bit lower at 139. And his serum anti-PLA to our antibody testing was still negative. So this is when I'm seeing him now, nine months later after a rituxan. Apparently hasn't done anything. Um, and then let's, I've got the final poll here. Uh, question three, what would you now treat this patient with? Um, answer one, a CNI. Uh, answer two, rituximab redosing. Uh, number three, cycl a cyclophosphamide-based regimen. Uh, number four, a different anti-CD20 agent. Or number five, some mixtures, some mixture of options one, two, or three. So while people vote, Roger, can I pose some questions. Of course, Mario. Um, there were serological changes, as Bill pointed out, that suggested the possibility of lupus. However, the pathology did not show tubular reticular inclusions, did not show subendothelial deposits, did not show a full house, but membranous lupus is a funny lesion and um, there is paucity of serological changes and the pathology is not always full blown. Uh, I wonder, somehow I seem to remember that if you do exostosin one and two staining, that in several of those cases that was also staining for, for the PLA2R uh, antigen. And um, I wonder if this is, what explains the negativity of the antibody uh, that this in fact is a membranous lupus. That's question one. And question two is, is it possible that this gentleman, I'm sorry? Go ahead. That was uh, massively nephrotic was losing all the rituximab in the urine and that's why he didn't respond. I don't know, I would be interested to know the CD1920 assays, what they show. Yeah, that's, that's a yeah, that's a good question, um, and we will uh, we'll probably get to that. Um, 
You know, the, the as far as the lupus goes, I mean, it, it, it's possible, but, you know, there was really no full house, nothing else going on, no mesangial expansion. It's a possibility. We do not have exostosin. We're working on that. I think we'll be able to get that in the next few months because I think more and more of these complicated cases just need to get stained for as many things as you can because you can't have enough information. Um, Let's share the results here. Here's uh, the results um, of the poll. Uh, we have one CNI, 15% rituximab de redosing, 62% uh, now says a cyclophosphamide-based regimen. Um, two people said a different anti-CD20 agent, and the 15% said some mixtures of one, two, or three. So let me take over here and uh, talk a little bit about the questions that kind of that uh, that came up related to this. So I think I don't need to go over this anymore um, about the glomerular sink and or going to spontaneous remission and the deposits and the proteinuria are lagging because um, we talked about that at length. Uh, and Dr. Glassick actually brought a very nice point up for question mark number, you know, for number three, which is a question mark, meaning something else. You know, as far as the deposits of proteinuria lagging, I mean, that that, that would, that might be okay at, at time one, but not nine months later when he's uh, uh, still super, super nephrotic and still has an anti-PLA2 antibodies. So I don't, I don't think it would lag that long to that degree. If anything, his proteinuria got worse. So um, to answer the Dr. Glassick's original question, I am disturbed by it. I don't have an answer for it, but these are some of the possibilities. And maybe it is uh, expression from something else and PLA, uh, false positive PLA2R staining. Uh, next slide. You, uh, you can click the screen, Roger. Go okay, ahead. thank you. Yeah. So uh, some of this membranous glomerulonephritis, rituximab resistance, some of this was brought up. And this is irrelevant because we don't have a PLA2 antibody, but you know, the higher level serum PLA2R responds, or or perhaps worse, the worst cases of of membranous respond better with a cyclophosphamide phosphamide based regimen. Although I'm not sure if it responds better or just faster. It's clearly faster. It may not be better, it just may take rituxan a lot longer. Um, so that really isn't quite relevant here because the PLA2R is, is not present, but you know, if we're assuming it's an, another antibody. Maybe that's going to be the same. The same principle will hold for any of the other antibodies that can cause membranous. That uh, the cyclophosphamide-based regimen isn't really resistance, but you know you need something a little stronger. Um, Mario brought this up. What about rituximab loss in the urine? He's you know fairly nephrotic. We could tell by his uh, serum albumin. Um, so you know we don't know how to measure that. Um, he brought up following CD19 cells. We did not have that. Uh, with the first dose, so I have no idea if he ever, if it ever uh, really worked, but I think that's a really good way to follow something like this to see, you know, if, if CD19 does not go down, it could be because of, of loss of rituximab in the urine, and then you could increase either the dose or the frequency and try to, because you're really not, you know, although we don't really know that this, that it's the, the dropping of the CD20 and 19 that leads to this, it certainly seems to correlate with the response and would be a very good surrogate for the effectiveness of rituximab. And if these went down and didn't respond, it'd be a whole lot different than if they did went down and didn't respond. And then the other is rituximab neutralizing antibodies. Rituximab is a chimeric uh, antibody, mouse human antibody. And I found this fascinating when I looked it up yesterday that 20 to, 20 to 40% of people with membranous will reform anti-rituximab antibodies. Doesn't mean that it's enough to completely neutralize it, but it's not irrelevant either. And that really suggests the role for one of the other uh, anti-CD20 agents, afatumab or benedutuzumab. Um, and um, I'm laughing at my pronunciation, <laughs> even though I tried practicing it. Um, and that was uh, option, uh, you know, number four in there, a different anti-CD20 agent. Because that's, uh, there's been, you know, some idea that that works. And here, I'll show you a report here that, uh, was in AJKD last year of three cases of refractory PLA2R positive membranous nephropathy given uh, obinidazumab. And, you know, I want to go through each of these because, you know, um, I'm not absolutely convinced though that it was the, the, the CD20 agent, the change that really made the difference. Because if you look here, if you can follow my arrow, they got rituxan. And what's really important is the PLA2 antibody. I really, I look at that's what you're treating. You know, the proteinuria will go away. Everything will resolve if the antibody goes away. Of course, in this case, we don't have an antibody, and that's the, that's the fly in the ointment here. But 
regardless for your average membranous PLA2R membranous, the antibody goes down pretty nicely after the rituxan, gets another dose of rituxan, and it's going down. And I think what made them panic is the proteinuria went up. But I don't think you really can assess a lot of these things until six, not six to 12 months go by. And then they gave, you know, the other agent, and sure enough, uh, the antibody went continue to go down. But who knows that if it wouldn't go down anyway, and the proteinuria wouldn't have gone down anyway. So I'm not convinced here that this patient needed it, but nevertheless, had just, a very nice response. Just, a, just a, another thought here. Well, Go ahead, Steve. Go no, go back to the previous slide, because this comes up in other situations. If you look at the serum creatinine initially, when the proteinuria starts to go down, and then all of a sudden it goes up. So the creatinine originally was 2.2, creatinine goes up to 1.6. Maybe the proteinuria went up because the renal function was getting a little better as well. Mm -hmm. and, and Good point. Just, a, just another yep. thought. Yep, yep. Um, here's case number two they described. Again, here you can see this patient got cyclosporin and then got cyclophosphamide, and the PLA2 antibody is coming down pretty nicely, you know, a 75% reduction by nine months. Proteinuria goes down, kind of comes up. Um, it, you know, who knows what would have happened? You know, they gave the rituxan here because the PLA2 antibody was going up, but maybe didn't give it enough time to really make a difference uh, because it looks like about four or five months later, they go ahead and give obinizumab, and sure enough, things get better. Now, if there's one thing that makes an argument for their, for here is the fact that once they gave it, there was a rapid, rapid reduction in PLA2 antibody and a fairly rapid decrease in proteinuria as well. Um, but these aren't the cleanest cases in my book. And here's the third one, initially got rituxan, and the PLA2 antibody went way down. And, you know, if I ever saw that, I wouldn't do anything else. I would, you know, if I gave more rituxan, it would only be because my CD20, 19 went up. Um, and here it was still six at three months. Um, and uh, I would just hang in there and wait for the uh, proteinuria to go down because we know how long it can lag. But again, they got uh, it got it the, the, the second, uh, the third dose of anti CD20, and things got better pretty quickly. So, it, you know, I, it makes a decent case, but I'm not actually convinced that these patients uh, really needed it, but uh, it's not to say that it isn't a great drug. It's It's been shown to be more cytotoxic, have a faster response than rituximab, and certainly no neutralizing antibodies, but still would have the risk of being lost in the urine with someone who is very, very nephrotic, uh, as was the case here. And this is uh, the other approach, which has been brought up, um, and that was a combination of drugs. And and this was for, this is out of Boston and first presented in BMC Nephrology in 2017. And what they're using, they had back then they had a low dose prednisone. And so this really, I don't know if this was a part of the therapy, but they would add a little cytoxin for two months on top of rituximab. So it was low dose cyclophosphamide, a rapid prednisone taper, and, and a pretty much standard rituximab therapy, although they give a second dose at four months and then at eight months and then every four months thereafter. And uh, they, they called it, I think, RCP. Uh, I'll see what it is here. But in that study, um, yeah. They had only 15 patients. It was This was not controlled. This is just what they tried. They had seven were initial therapy and eight with relapsing or refractory disease. And at 37 months, they had 100% partial or complete remission, which occurred in a medium time of two months for the partial, which is really pretty quickly, and 13 months, which is a complete remission, uh, complete remission being less than 0.3 grams. That's pretty fast, uh, at least compared to historical controls. So the proteinuria after 12 months and everybody on average went from uh, 8.2 to 0.3, a pretty, pretty impressive response. Um, and it's not something I think that I've always, you know, thought of. It certainly wasn't studied in Mentor. It was, it, there was no uh, cyclophosphamide in there. And here you can see the, the partial remissions going up, you know, fairly quickly here, 80% by, you know, 80% by 12 months and complete remission uh, fairly soon, you know, within a year, year and a half, we've got 80%. Um, but again, the end was small here and it was not controlled. Um, what's interesting is that they've now, this is still in press. And the only reason I knew it was in press is because the, the editorial has been, is, is, has been released. And then, but this has not been, re, has, was released before this was released, but they're both still in press. And this is a follow-up, same group, a lot more patients now. They've got 60 patients and much longer follow-up for 38 months. Half of these were PLA2 antibody positive. At 30 months, 100%. Partial remission, which is less than three grams, and by two years, 83% complete remission, 0.3 grams. The mean time to complete remission was 12.4 months, which I still think is pretty fast. 
immunologic remission, which I think is really remarkable, which is a normal anti-PLA2 antibody was 86% at three months. That is a fast reduction in PLA2R and 100% at six months. And if you can get, and you know, we really believe that the PLA2 antibody is going to go and it's pathogenic. Um, again, a little different than this case that you just hang in there and you'll get, um, you'll get a complete uh, clinical remission. So the median PC ratios went from 8.4 to 0.3 at 12 months. So that's really quite remarkable. Uh, but again, this is not controlled. Um, it's not, it was just what they, apparently that's what that, that is their membranous regimen now is they give this a couple months of Rituxim, uh, of cyclophosphamide and Rituximab it a little more aggressive than we do. I tend to give it, you know, initially two grams or whatever, and then every six months and they're going at four months. Um, I don't remember seeing, uh, the, uh, CD19 counts in here. I'll have to go back and look. I just found this yesterday online. And here's again, their, their graphs of their partial and their complete remissions. Um, so, you know, what do you do in this case? I mean, I don't know what to do in the sense of the, um, fact that it's PLA2R negative, I, but I know that's, I believe that something's doing it unless Dick's right. And, and it's being, um, you know, it's showing that the PLA2R is just being exposed, but, um, and it's a false positive PLA2R. The problem is you still have membranous glomerulonephritis. You're still having something that's causing membranous very severe membranous glomerulonephritis and very severe nephrotic syndrome. So I think you still have to treat this guy. And as Dick said, he'd bite the bullet and give rituximab. But I think rituximab didn't work. Did it not work because it went in the urine? Did it not work because maybe it was working? And by six months, he, you know, it went away and he needed another dose and didn't get it. Um, there's a lot of options here why it didn't work in him. But I know at nine months, he was very nephrotic and needed, needed something. So, you know, what did I do? I decided to kind of go with what uh, they're doing in Boston. We gave him two grams of rituximab. I started him on cyclophosphamide, kind of a low dose uh, compared to what Ponticelli suggests at 100 milligrams. And we're going to give it for a couple months. His prednisone, which was on for CIDP, we we're trying to taper off. Uh, the neurology people felt totally fine about, you know, they thought cyclophosphamide would ha might help his disease, rituximab might help his disease. Um, clearly, nothing has helped his disease to this point. He's pretty much debilitated, and I don't know there's anything that's going to make him any better or it's going to have nerve regeneration. And so, you know, response will be to be determined. And I'm um, not sure, Roger, that that's too much of a low dose. I mean, he was 67 kilograms, very, very wet. He might be 50 kilograms dry, and, and that's two mg per kg. So that, that's, a, that's a pretty darn good dose. Yeah, it is. I, you know, it, it is. Um, um, oh, by the way, I, somehow this got out of order. This was from their study that showed that the deposits, you know, they were biopsies of patients, the deposits completely went away. So, um, you know, I, Bill, that's a good point. Um, that is a good point. Uh, and we'll, you know, we're trying to follow, we'll follow his white count, but I think this is kind of the last hurrah. This is, it, you know, it, it's, it's going to be difficult to take care of him. He's in an LTAC. Um, he's got a chronic peg and a chronic trach and, and we'll have to see what happens. But my feeling was if we don't get rid of, rid of this nephrotic syndrome, he's going to die of, of nephrotic syndrome. Something's going to happen. You can't have an albumin of 0.5 infinitely. And um, and survive and be this, uh, be this ill. I'm not very optimistic, no matter what. He has a terrible neurologic disease to start with. But I thought as I, my feeling was, let's give him, let's do a full court press on him. And hopefully, you know, I didn't want him on prednisone because it was D cubes and my thought about, but he's, he's at huge risk of infection as it is. Of course, we gave him Bactrim as well. Um, and uh, he's still on a statin, he's still on a coagulated, but I'm not optimistic, but our thought was to give him, you know, the bet, the, the highest dose that we thought he could, get away with without, you know, too much uh, morbidity and mortality. And I pray for the lack of both of those, but I'm not optimistic. Um, anybody would have done anything differently just for Tuxan. I really like the idea of one of the other O's, except, you know, Mario's point's good. He might lose it in his urine, but, you know, if we, in a perfect world, we could follow his CD19 counts and make sure they went down and, 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 and see what happened. And it's very possible that one of those two scenarios, the reason he, he didn't really fail Rituxan, he failed he failed the system, but, uh, you know, we have, he was not, he didn't follow up with two nephrologists before they refused to take him back. So, I mean, there's a lot of things going on here and we're just, I was trying to come up with a regimen that, you know, would give it kind of the last hurrah, you know, uh, hail Mary, but it's a very difficult disease. I'm sorry. That's all right. Did you get uh, an IgG level on him just, uh, to see how, much is dumping in the urine. I mean, with those the cubitus ulcers and the full-blown nephrosis, as you pointed out, he's going to get infected. 
Yeah, no, we did not. What what if we what if it were high? Would you give them IgG? No, I would give it if it's low. That's what I meant. If it were really low, would you give it? Yeah, I would. Well, so the problem with that is he might just dump it all out. And I'll tell you, at one point when we were, because he really came in for diuresis, and uh, it was initially what he came in for. So we were giving him albumin and Lasix, and his protein, his urine protein to creatinine ratio was 66 grams per gram. Now, granted, he has no creatinine, so you have to take that into account. That ratio is based on someone who has a very, very low creatinine production. But it more than doubled. And so, you know, for all I know, if we give him IgG, that's just going to go out in his urine too. But, um, and I don't know how long we can do that for... I mean, I, that's not going to happen where he ended up. He's not going to get chronic IgG uh, infusions, but it's it's an interesting thought. Um, you know, I was hoping two months wouldn't be enough, wouldn't be too long. You know, you got to come up with something. Um, you know, I've used as I a say, lot of combination when I want somebody to be induced quickly with uh, CNIs, waiting for then the rituxan to kick in. But but you know, as soon as you withdraw those, if the rituxan still hasn't kicked in, he's still going to be nephrotic. So this is a really uh, cool. Uh, if it works, you know, a cool approach, because I think that both of these drugs could give him a lasting remission as opposed to the CNIs where the last, the, the, there's never really a lasting remission with them. In my mind, he failed Rituxan, but he might not have failed Rituxan. It may, you know, it might have not lasted or it might have started to work and he needed another dose. But in my mind, he, he was, he had failed Rituxan and in, in people who fail Rituxan, I think the next step would be cyclophosphamide. I didn't want to give him a full dose cyclophosphamide. I wanted, I wanted to, and I don't know if he's ever going to, you know, follow up to get more, you know, whatever. So I just try to give him something that they'll give him every day, give him the rituxan and keep my fingers crossed. But clearly I'm flying by the seat of my pants. Um, and I think that's what we have to do a lot of case, times in these difficult cases. Um, I'm opening up to any other opinions, uh, what they would do, not do. Otherwise. Uh... Roger. Yes, Dick. I would try IVIGG. And what do you do? What is your goal there? Because three of the five cases with contactin one membranous responded with a complete or partial remission with IVIGG. It's out from left field, I would agree, but you know, you are in desperate straits here. Mm -hmm. The sky mm -hmm. hasn't responded to a standard therapy. And you're you're grasping at straws at this point. So you're doing it like you would like you give IVIG for other autoimmune conditions, basically. Well, it's it's used in treatment of polyneuropathy, inflammatory polyneuropathy, and it's been quite effective. And as I said, three of the five cases with this contact in one associated uh, membranous. Mm -hmm. uh, with uh, polyneuropathy uh, responded with a complete or partial remission. So why not? So absolutely, why not? And, and that means I got to go back and talk to the neurology and see if that's something they offered him originally uh, for his disease. Because okay. I know they, you know, they, 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 they the, the, our neurology department is very strong. And, uh, and I don't remember, that was not on my radar, but uh, we'll go back and look at that. Well, I'm going to, we're running, off, we're running quite late. I want to wrap this up. Great discussion. I learned. I, I prepared for the. I prepared for this conference, and I probably learned more from the conference than what I learned in preparing for this conference. So that's what's so great about this. I want to thank everybody for being so smart, as always, in the chat room, um, and uh, making you know making me think and learn. And that's why we're doing this. And uh, this was a great conference. I appreciate everybody's input. We'll be back next week. Uh, and uh, until then, everybody stay safe. And thank you very much. And join our channel.